fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, you are back in the House of Mystery and you've come to the interview part of the show. And on the other line, I'm pleased to have an author, Sean Michael. Thank you for being here, Sean. Thank you very much for having me. Wow, so now you've got a huge amount of books out. Uh, I, I didn't realize how much. Um, well, for, I, I, So where did it start for you? I mean, have you been writing for years? I have been writing for years. I've, I've written an awful long time. I've actually been published since 2003. Um, Torcare Press uh, two good friends of mine started it because there was nothing at the time that really was publishing gay romance other than I think St. Martin's Press in Kensington, but they were um, print books. There was nobody doing any e-books, and so they opened up Torcare Press, wow. and I was one of their first authors. Wow, so that's, um, so you broke the door down. <laughs> yeah, we kind of did. Yeah, um, other publishers came in afterwards, um, I think Lucid and Changeling and uh, Dream Spinner, but we proved that you could make it work. Well, so when that happened, like in 2003, you were saying, so when that happened and and uh, you guys flew out there with this whole new style of, of book, um, was there a lot of struggle with that? Was there a lot of backlash? Was there, how, what was the general feeling when it started? It was very slow going to start with. We made very little money. Um, we would, you know, if you sold 10 books that month, you'd, you'd be cheering. And there wasn't a lot of places to sell them. Um, I believe Amazon was one of the first places that we could sell the e-books. Because there were, there were e-books were already out, just nobody was doing the MM. In fact, there were a number of publishers um, who said no, no MM, you know, we don't want gay romance. And... Mm. Uh, well, what, why do you think that is? Is it just because um, 2003, things are come a long way. <laughs> they have, so, yes. Yeah. I think the traditional romance publishers didn't think their fans would want the gay romance, and they didn't want to put them off. Hmm. I think that's, that's what it's down to, because I know a lot of people who happen to read, um, you know, something with two guys and a girl, and oh, in this one, they touch, boys touched, and suddenly they were interested in male romance rather than just the traditional romance. And so I think the, the publishers discovered, the other publishers that were saying we don't want the gay romance, discovered that, okay, people were, were open to this and were willing to read this and wanted to read this. So you think that it was uh, an area that was sort of starved? Like, I, uh, you know, people, maybe they have wanted it for a while, but nobody would really ask? Yeah, I think so. And I think, I think it's a lot. Like fan, I think it was quite normal for fan fiction since, you know, the Kirk and Spock days. Fan fiction totally embraced male romance. But uh, it took a lot longer for the traditional romance to, to embrace it. And I do think a lot of it was because the, the traditional publishers didn't believe in it and didn't think that, that their, their readers would want it. Right. And, of course, once they discovered that they did, you know, Harlequin has Karina Press now and and all the publishers that the, the online publishers that weren't taking it started taking it. So it comes down to money. Uh, absolutely, yes. The <laughs> publishers start, absolutely. Yeah. Well, they're a business. They, they, have, they want to survive, and they don't want to just publish anything. I, uh, I get yes. that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so how did you yourself personally um, get into writing male-male romance rather than any other field out there? I did start with fan fiction. Um, I started with a show called The Sentinel on in the 90s on the CW, and it was about this cop who had these extra senses, extra ordinary senses, and he wanted with a guide, and the guide came and lived with him, and it was like, oh, this would be so much better if these guys were actually a couple. 
<laughs> so I, I started reading it, and then um, when I saw The Phantom Menace, I fell in love with Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan. Again, as a couple, I started writing it. And then it was, well, why can't I do this with my own stuff? Why do I have to use somebody else's characters? I've always wanted to write original stuff, so let me just start writing original stuff. And I, I did, and I had met um, my friends, B. Tortuga and Julia Talbot, through fan fiction, and, uh, and they said, well, let's, let's publish this stuff. And ba-doom, there we are. So what do you find when you write something like um, romance? Do, um, where, where do you get the romance from? Like, I don't know how else to put this because um, when I talk to, you know, crime or mystery or true crime or all, all these different other uh, fields of writing, I, I can ask them, you know, where did the murder come from? Like, where did, where does your feeling for that come from. So where does the romance come from? Well, I believe everybody deserves love. No matter who you are, you deserve love, and you deserve to love the people who you want to love. Not be, you know, you have to love this person or that person because you're in the same race or sociogeographic or gender or whatever. That you should love who you love and that you deserve a happy ending. And so I want to write people happy endings. And the characters just kind of I say they show up in my head, which they kind of do. You know, I'll be thinking, oh, I'll see somebody, I'll go, oh, that would be a neat character. And suddenly I've got this guy who's an artist who does this, who does that. And lo and behold, another character shows up to be his person. Wow. So, and, and so when you have characters, now, I'm not sure, but uh, looking at these books that you've done recently, the, the Teddy Bear Club adding up to love and the more the merrier they almost look like a, um, a collection they are there's um, they're part of a uh, series called the teddy bear club and the teddy bear club is a group of uh, dads single dads single gay dads who uh, meet together uh, start off informally and now they meet twice a week um, just to get together and talk have somewhere to put their kids so their kids can play together and they can just get some adult interaction and with like-minded people and so the stories come out of that. Each of the books follows a different couple who go to these informal meetings. So you don't have to read them all. You can just read one, and it doesn't have to be in any particular order. Yeah, you can just read that. I think it works a little better if you read them all in that you'll know who the, you know, because the other characters show up. They do cameos. Um, they'll be at the meeting, and they'll mention so-and-so and so-and-so. And I think it might be a little richer to have to know the first two guys' stories when you see them in the third book, but you definitely don't need to have. Yeah. So do you plan on making this a longer-term series and, and, and having even more characters come, to, come into the series? Probably. If, the, if they continue to pop up and, and ask for their stories to be written, I will. <laughs> well, it's, I just, it's, it's curious when you say that. So um, how do you know when you're going to write uh, about something that you had the idea of? If I have the idea and the characters are there and I have the... I usually have anywhere from three to six stories going at one time. And part of that is because I'll get this idea and it's just got to be written. I find if I write down um, an outline, I never get the story written. There's something about writing it all down in point form that then my brain goes, the story's been told. I don't need to, to write it out again. Um, so I, I will, if it's strong enough, I'll just sit and, and get it started, and then I'll maybe work on a couple thousand words on one story, and, and then when it starts to feel a little more I'm pushing instead of it flowing, I'll move to a different story. Um, so that's how they get, the ones that are strong enough get written, the ones that are, are like I in my head and I can't get them out without writing them down. Those are the ones that get written. And mm. usually that's how a series will start like that. I don't always know that a series is going to be a series. Sometimes... I'll think I'm writing a short story, and suddenly it's a full book, and it's got three or four characters that are going, hey, we were a side character. We'd like our story next, please. Or I like the concept so much that I will find new characters for it. Well, I mean, I just wonder. So, okay, now we've got some characters. How do you develop them? Like, because they're not real. Right? No. No. So you've now I, I should clear that up. So for you, when you get your characters, they are totally out of your imagination, right? You don't you don't right. take it like uh, it isn't like a brother or sister no, that I'm, you've taken. No, 
I might be inspired in that I see somebody, um, you know, in the bus with two heavy bags looking sad. So I might riff off of that, but that'll be the most. That you know, it's not people I know. It's not characters on TV or anything. They do just kind of appear in my head. Sometimes, you know, I'll get this character, the guy who owns the coffee shop, for instance, in in the uh, Teddy Bear Club series. And all I knew was that he owned a coffee shop, he had twin girls, and his husband had died of cancer. That's all I knew. But as I write, I get more. It comes to me. And some, the odd time, I'll be writing stuff, and it's like, why is he being such a jerk? And then something else will come out, and it's like, oh, well, that's why he's being a jerk, because of this thing in his background. Other times, they'll show up, and it's like I know everything about them. All their details. Hmm. before I even start actually writing them. Did you ever wonder why? <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't question it because it works for me. <laughs> well, and so I, I now a lot of authors I've, I've spoke to over the years, uh, quite often when they're um, in the fiction category, I ask them, um, are your characters like your kids? And quite often a lot of them say yes. Um, how do you feel? Yeah, I don't know if I'd call them my kids. Um, they're more like friends, I think. Okay. Because they are, well, especially while I'm writing them, they're very real in my head. Very real. Well, I, now, are, are there any times that, um, this is one I get, are there any times that you've uh, uh, met someone in your life, in your real life, um, that you absolutely can't stand or has it been absolutely terrible to you? Have you ever taken a, and made a character about them and maybe give them a bad life or killed them off? I have never done that. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 the people I don't like, I tend to just kind of I box them off and I ignore them. Um, I don't need that kind of negativity in my life. I might have done it 20 years ago if I had been writing at the time, um, but I've I've gotten to the point in my life that it's like, you know what, I, I don't have time for things that make me unhappy or super angry that I can that I can push away. So oh, that's cool. That's cool. No, I just uh, some of the some of the bigger writers I've talked to um all seem to have uh found people uh, that have come into their life that that's caused them some uh terrible grief of some sort and they've uh They've offed them in the book. <laughs> well, I've, and and because I'm super lucky, I have not met anyone who's caused me terrible, terrible grief. Well, uh, then, yeah. People I don't like, or and who don't like me, but but there's been nothing awful. I I I am blessed that I know that because I I have not had um, awful people. I have not had very terrible things happen in my life. I I know that I'm very lucky in this. Well, that helps too. Then, um, I, you know. So, how? Wh who do you think your your reader is? Like, who do you feel like most of your readers are? Or do you have any stats on what kind of people read your books? I don't have stats. Um, I tend not to track. I do know that um, a lot of uh, women read my books. Um, I am assuming more middle age to older only because that tends to be the people I interact with on Facebook, like who will ask me questions or respond to my posts and that. Um, but that, that's an assumption. I have no stats. And also, I have been to a couple of conferences, the um, Romantic Times conference. I've been to a few of those, and it does tend to be um, middle-aged and older women who come by and, and uh, want to see me. Hmm. So uh, do you think there's a reason for that? Um in your mind, do you have any thoughts to why um, more woman, um, middle-aged woman, as you say, would, would read these types of books rather than, than men? I think women are looking um, for the escape. They're looking for the fantasy of a romance. Um, I think, and I don't know if there's a, a, if guys just tend to be more visual and women more... Um, reading. I know for me that that's true, that I, I love reading. I mean, I enjoy TVs and movies and stuff too, but for romance, I would much prefer to read it than to watch it. 
You know, I was told, um, I've interviewed a few um, that write romance books and male-male ones, and, and um, kind of one of the more common answers I get on that is because um, uh, the women really appreciate um, intimacy and intimacy between a couple, um, just just talking and and being romantic and and all of that. Whereas quite often in the straight world, the the, the men are not always that type of men. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of that too. Um, yeah, because you can have a romantic scene that doesn't have uh, that can be very sensual and and um, very satisfying that has no sex in it at all. That is is just about two people connecting, um, and I mean, it, I I don't like to generalize, and it is such a generalization that that guys are not emotional and don't have don't like to talk, and uh, oh yeah, yeah, and women do. Um, certainly, some of my characters are like that, um, but but yeah, I, I hate to say that 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 guys like doing this and women like doing that. I I don't like saying that. Because I know as soon as you start getting into actually talking to people, it's not like that necessarily. So now, now when you write male male romance, are you looking to have um, an additional theme in there, or is it just are these straight romance books, or have you got mystery in there, murder? Have you got uh, another sort of gen something else going on? Most of them are just romance. Um, I have a few um, horror books, well, horror books, um, mystery books. They're called the, it's the Supernatural series, uh, Supernatural Explorers. They are a group of ghost hunters. And in those, um, there are, in the first one, the, the guy is possessed by one of the ghosts they're hunting. In the second one, they have to lay a ghost to rest. And that's got elements of ghost and horror. I guess that's a horror genre. Um, in fact, the second book, I actually had to pull back. I had just gone full-fledged into it. I was reading it back, and I go, oh, this is supposed to be a romance. I can't. I have to <laughs> plaster it out and redo it. Because I, I had gone too far into the horror for it to still be a romance. Um, I really enjoyed writing those, uh, writing those, and I do. I mean, I love Stephen King. I love reading horror. Um, I'm not so good with watching it just because I get spooked. And then I have a hard time going to bed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's no good. Uh, so when you get into the paranormal side, wh wh where do you come from on that side? Do you have a paranormal belief? Do you sort of have uh, a belief in spirits and ghosts and, and, and afterlife and all that? Do you have that already going in your mind? I, a little bit. I, I don't believe, um, I don't think there's like, well, I don't know. I shouldn't say that because um, when we moved into our house for the first two years, whenever I woke up, there was a ghost on the ceiling of a young boy. And I don't know when he doesn't come by anymore. But it and it was and I had never had that experience before. But this was there was there was nothing else for me to call it. It was this ghost, and it wasn't scary and it wasn't threatening. It was just there. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't have a strong. Uh, otherworldly belief, um, but, but I like it, it. It must have been enough to. I mean, you were aware of this 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 ghost for a while, so and you. It must it so you must have, be open to it at least. Oh yeah, I'm definitely open to it for sure. I'm, I'm, I'll we'll say I'm undecided. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe there's more to the world than what we can see. I just don't know what it is. Right, right, and and so when you write paranormal romance, um, so are you are you kind of really getting into the fantasy of of what type of characters you're going to use, or is it just pretty straightforward a ghost or uh, and how do you decide? Well, with the ghost with the ghost ones, it's um, I uh, my characters buy into it, so I buy into it that ghosts exist and they're searching for them and whatnot. Uh, with uh, the paranormal side where it's like werewolves and dragon shifters and whatnot, that is more of just the fantasy of um, the werewolf and the pack, the vampires, all the mythos that goes with that, and uh, same with the dragon shifters. Um, wow. it, it's that these are just cool, because I don't believe dragons exist. 
No? <laughs> no. I don't believe wolves are vampires. So. <laughs> Only on TV. Or like now, uh, the nose. And so... It's it's really so when you have written all these books when you 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 when you put a book out, um, is there some sort of theme beside the story? Is there an underlying theme or subject that you'd like people to take home with it after they've read? So I you know I buy your book I read it and of course I get the the, the top story between a couple or, or or a ghost or whatever it was, and at the end of the book besides that. Is there some underlying thing you'd like me to have? I want people to believe in love and to believe that everybody deserves their love story and their happy ending, no matter who they are. And that that really is, is the message that I would like people to get from reading my books. Well, and and that really that I, I do not I do not write to really to to other themes that I'm aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, what would your advice be now? So, if you if you if you hear from a, a new writer, someone that's writing in this sort of um, style of book, um, what what advice would you give to them? Write what you want to write. Don't write X because you think that's what people are going to buy. Because um, I think it's going to make. I mean, you can if you want, but I think it's going to make it a lot harder on you if you're trying to force yourself into constraints um, and I think if you can write a little bit every day keep coming back to it because there are days when I don't want to write it's totally work it's just work it's not fun at the moment but if I make myself just sit down and keep writing then you know I'm ready when it when it is fun again when it when the words are flowing when I can spend the same hour that I was taking to eke out 200 words I can eke out a thousand in that, that same hour um, it's, it's got to be a habit, I think. If, if you're serious about it and you want to uh, to be a career, I think you do need to make it a habit. Um. Huh. Now, so what do you do? Um, like, for instance, um, I don't know if this affects you, but um, let's say let's take the t the year 2020 here, and um, you know there was the COVID, there was the um, all of the Black Lives Matters. There's all these riots. There's a real iffy yeah. presidency and all this stuff. And there's a lot of stress and pressure and conspiracies and people calling names and things are on fire. So you got all this stuff going on. Um, can you still write like you, as if none of it was going on? No, no. I I had I had six months where my writing was was at best half of what it usually is. Um, it was just hard to. I, I had I waffled between days of where I sat in horror watching Twitter, and um, and worrying and stressing and being upset and uh, um, and then other days where I, I was able to shut it all out and work. Um, but yeah, no, 2020's been hard. Yeah. 2020's been crazy. Um, the, the pandemic part. I mean it. As far as being stuck at home and not being able to go out, this is kind of my life anyway. So that was not a change. But now there's all these people dying. So yeah, it's it's stressful. Um, and I I do if if I get to I mean I'm Canadian, so it doesn't directly affect me, but it does. Whatever happens south of the border does definitely affect us. And uh, I will have days where if I dare to go on Twitter, or my husband will say, Oh, did you see what <laughs> happened today in politics? And I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just get going, and I I need to really stop myself and go. Okay, take a breath. You're upset. You've expressed it. Let it go because you can't fix it by being so upset about what's going on. Yeah, it's not going to matter either way. But I I go through the same thing. I mean, I'm writing true crime and murder, and you'd think it would help, but no, I it blocks me down a lot of times. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is. But I know plenty of writers that have had no issue at all. So Writing is a really place, so I, I very much try to, to leave that stuff out. But a lot of the time, like I said, I have to just, I've for the first time ever, I've had, I'll go for a week and a half and not even look at Twitter or Facebook. Oh, good. <laughs> because I know I will find stuff that will upset me. <laughs> and I do find it harder to write if I'm, you know, really upset. 
um, yeah, it's strange how that how that can affect you when a lot of times on on either one of those platforms you don't know most of the people anyway that are upsetting you. No, but it's it's not necessarily them that are upsetting me, but it's it's what's happening that's upsetting. Yeah. You know, um, I'm a I'm I'm a white middle aged woman. I have it very good, and I knew things were bad for people of color in the states, especially, but also here. I didn't know how bad until the riot started, until I saw things, people started posting stuff on Facebook and on, on um, Twitter uh, far more, so I, I was in my view a lot more. Um, and you can't, you can't just ignore that, you know? Um, yeah. And it yeah. didn't matter if I knew the person or not at this point. It was how could, how could we let people be treated like this? Yeah, it's been pretty rough. The state side, it's been, um, it, in some cities, it's really bad, uh, yeah. much worse than others. Um, across Canada, it's pretty light comparatively. Comparatively, sure. we still definitely, yeah. have, definitely have the same issues are going on up here, but yes, it yeah. is a little... Uh, well, I think Canadians handle it in a slightly different way. Um, like you don't have 17-year-old kids going down the road with an AR-15 shooting black white matters. You don't have that. Uh, whereas that that ha that has happened in the states. They shoot each other up yeah. a lot. Uh, yeah. they, they they handle these sort of issues way more aggressively, and that 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 that's what's scary. Um, Absolutely, so, yeah. You know, because it gets out of control. So, what do you do for writer's block? Like, what? What is there something you you do yourself to get out of a block? My um, big. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, even if it wasn't the COVID and all these, let's say an, it's a it's a normal year, everything's sunshiny and and happening and everything, and you kind of all of a sudden can't write. You you get in a block. Uh, is there a way out? My big thing is that I don't work on just one document, right? I've got, as I said, three to six going at any time, and, and usually there's a couple that kind of are like, sorry, sort of, they stalled and they got left stalled for a while that I can pick up um, later and, and work on. But so if I have a happy family story and I have a BDSM story and I have a paranormal story going, if I'm blocked on one, I can usually switch over to the other and get moving with it. So oh. that, yeah, so it. I don't have a lot of time where I have blocks. Every now and then I get super lazy and I don't feel like doing anything, and then I will binge <laughs> things. This weekend we binged Lucifer. Oh, oh, there you go. <laughs> it's, gone, it's gone to Netflix, hasn't it? It has, yeah. And is it? has it got better or worse, or do you think it's the same? I think it's gotten better. Um, this fifth season in particular was really good. Um, they've only showed the first eight episodes because they apparently hadn't finished filming the last one when everything got closed down. Um, so there's four more to come, I think, for this season before it's over. But I think the move to Netflix um, let them, they don't have as many censor things they have to worry about. And I, this season they thought was the last season. Apparently they're getting another one. But there's nothing like telling a show that it's your very last season for them to all of a sudden everything seems to get upped in the writing department and the and stuff yeah. i know um marvel's agents of shield i'm a huge sci-fi and fantasy fan uh, especially when it comes to tv and movies and with that show that some seasons were good some were bad and then they had um this past summer they showed their final season and i guess it was because they knew it was their final season it was like, oh my God! I wish the show had been like this all the way through, because it was amazing. <laughs> the death, the death roll. Yeah. Uh, so, what is it about something that makes it good for you, like good writing? Uh, is it is it in the in the literary sense? Is it in the wording, or is it just truly about the story and characters? For me, it's about the story and the characters, um, especially the characters. Um, there's nothing worse than having a, a show where you're going, the show's been on for 10 years, that character would never do that. That is so frustrating to me, and I, I consider that bad writing. Or if you have a movie that's got this really awesome idea, and they don't, it's a boring movie, or it feels like it's, you know, it's a two-hour movie, it feels like it's an hour too long, I put that down a lot to writing. 
it, they, they had this great idea, they couldn't make it happen, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I find frustrating or the most is uh, um, when, when they're doing a show in a different time period and the writing is modern. So yes. they say and do phrases that we would say and do now, and it's supposed to be the 40s. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just sort of, it really, really throws me because it's like they would never talk that way. That's wrong. And I'll stay focused on what, when they do that, and it wrecks the series for me. So, yeah. I guess, yeah. Uh, no, I, I can see that. I know when I write um, fantasy, I've got one very, very much fantasy uh, book. It's uh, currently out of print, but it's called Wind Brothers. And I know when I was getting it edited, um, every time I used OK, the person said, this is a fantasy novel. Are they going to say OK? And it's like, no, that's a 20th century word yeah. that we use. And yeah. this is, I mean, it's not a, it, this isn't a, in our world at any time period, but it's, a, it's, it's another world. And why would they use that particular word? So I know exactly what you mean about, about not using yeah. the right language. Yeah, I'll see it, or I'll see something from the 50s, and someone, oh, thank you for your service to an officer, and it's like, well, come on. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's strange. <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes I could see, I guess probably some writers are, are working heavy duty to put out a lot of scripts for a lot of shows, and they just have a probably a formula way of doing it, and 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 sometimes it gets mixed, but, uh, but it bothers me, but yeah. anyway. You know, enough about me. Um, so, well, where do you see yourself going now? Are, are you going to continue to stay in this 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 type of writing? Do you, do you see yourself going into sci-fi or something more like that as, as you're a fan of it? I love sci-fi. I love watching it. I love reading it. And I don't know, maybe that's why I'm intimidated by it as a writer. Um, I don't think I can do it as well as my favorites can. So I'm not going to. Um, I don't want to put something subpar out there. Um, I think that's a lot of it, because um, I do. You know, if you ask me what's your favorite genre, and it's definitely sci-fi and fantasy. Um, wow. But uh, and I do. I've, I've got this Wind Brothers book. It's got four other parts to it, and, I, and I've, it's this huge, big world. And um, but it's a lot harder to write because I have I'm. I very much want it to be really, 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 really good and to live up to these images I have in my head. Um, not that my romance isn't good, but for me it's much easier to write. It, it com comes really naturally. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't. I, I, all you can do is work at it and see where it goes, I guess. Actually, yeah. You know, you, never, you might surprise yourself. I might, yeah, and I'd, I'd love to get this finished because I also have another fantasy series um, in mind that I'd like to do. Um, I wrote a book, a short story based on uh, Seven Deadly Sin, but it's a fantasy book. Um, and uh, when I wrote, I wrote it for a call. And when I had uh, finished it, it was like the characters were, like I, I said, when I have a character show up, if I don't know everything about them as I write, that comes out. So of course, even though the stories only about this short period in their life. I have all this background and the whole world background and stuff, and I'd really like to give that one a try, too. So uh, it's a matter of carving the time out and sitting down and doing it. Right, um, right. Uh, so what are your biggest influences? Uh, all, all that sci-fi and fantasy that I read and write, for sure. Um, I love Stephen King. Uh, and as far as the romance goes, I used to, when I was in university, I would I'd go to the library or I'd go to the used bookstore and I'd bring home Harlequins. And then I would just, when I was finished my work, I'd go to bed and I'd read the book and go to sleep. It, it would clear my mind. So I have, I have a tradition of it, of having read it for a long time. So I don't know if it's an influence in that I try and write like a certain author as much as these are the books that I enjoyed reading that were palate cleansers that were just a little bit of time off from every day. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, a little bit of Fabio. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Oh, that's hilarious. Um, well, that's great. Um, well, now, do you have a website people can come find you at? I do, but it hasn't been updated in about a million years. They're better off finding me on my blog. Okay. Um, let me see if I can get the address for you here. I don't know it by heart. Uh, of course, my computer has closed down since I last... <laughs> I, I tend to uh, to work with uh, 80 million tabs open, yeah. and uh, um, and I will leave my Facebook and my Twitter and my blog and all that open, and then every now and then the uh, the computer, and I'll leave stuff I want to get back to later, and then every now and then your thing updates on its own without asking you, and I lose <laughs> all my tabs. <laughs> That's <laughs> how it goes. So it's seanmichaelwrites.blogspot.com. Perfect. Now we're going to have that up on our website. People can find it, then one link, and just go click if they're listening and they want to find you. Um, Thank you. Wow. Certainly been an interesting conversation. I always love talking to writers, and i um, glad you took the time to uh, um, talk about your work. So, well, thank you. Um, Having me, you're, you're my first uh, spoken interview, and it's been a lot of fun. Well, yeah, and hopefully it, it remains fun. So <laughs> some of them are mean, so look out. <laughs> <laughs> well, our guest has been Sean Michael. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This is Peter. Of something with media.